probably one's awake. Um, it is really nice to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I actually worked at Heifer Farm in Rutland, Mass Massachusetts for the last 10 years, so uh, being here in Vermont feels like coming home. Um, in just a minute, we're going to start out with a video, um, just a little intro to Heifer and Heifer's work throughout the world, and then we're going to jump into talking more about Heifer USA specifically. environmentally responsible businesses and to educate the general public about sustainable agriculture and heifers work around the world. 
through the land, through Heifer USA, I sort of look at this mission in two parts. And, and my talk today is really going to be breaking this, this mission down and the actual work that's being done on the ground. So the first part, our mission is to create job opportunities in rural America by bringing farmers together to build socially and environmentally responsible businesses. We're doing this through our farmer co-ops. We have two cooperatives that we're going to talk about in just a minute that are farmer owned. One is a market garden cooperative and the other is uh, pasture based uh, proteins. Um, and then the last part of this mission statement um, is to educate the general public about sustainable agriculture and heifers work around the, around the world. That predominantly is happening at the ranch. And that's where I work. Um, my job at the ranch is to oversee all agricultural um, enterprises, so both in Market Garden. I don't know a lot about Market Garden, but I'm over that. And we have faith, I'm very thankful we have a wonderful farmer um, who leads that program. But I work mostly with the livestock at the ranch, and our enterprises there are scaling up. In terms of our cooperative, so this is, uh, we have a cooperative, New South Cooperative. Um, it's a very regional cooperative where farmers in Arkansas and the surrounding states have the ability to grow produce and bring it into this cooperative, which is then distributed through the CSA model as well as through um, wholesale channels. So um, it's, it's a sort of a fledgling cooperative. So far it's doing well. Um, it's a startup, so there's, you know, pains in that, but uh, we feel like it's going well. Um, CSAs, as some of you all know, have taken a, a dip in terms of uh, the, the number of people that are buying into CSAs, and we've actually experienced that a little bit this year, um, but it's going quite well. So our New South uh, Cooperative is local and organic fruits and vegetables. Um, we do warehousing and distribution. Um, for 2018, the revenues in this cooperative were $550,000. We are not profitable yet. Um, we're working towards break even in that. Um, and again, we work with farmers in this cooperative in Arkansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Missouri, and also Mississippi. One thing that I'll say, I'm gonna talk a lot about, uh, quite a bit about the ranch. But one of the main things that we're doing at the ranch is at, we're scaling up our agriculture immensely at the ranch, both in the market garden and also especially in livestock. And one of the things that, one of the reasons that we're doing this is to serve as a backstop as these cooperatives get off the ground. So Grassroots Cooperative, is anybody familiar with Grassroots? Because this is an e-commerce cooperative. Okay, Grassroots Cooperative is our meat side. Um, and we have about the same demographic of farmers growing in terms of the states as our, as our New South Cooperative. But basically, this is an e-commerce. So is anybody familiar with like Butcher Box or um, those, uh, Places you order a meal and it shows up yeah. at your doorstop. Yeah. So that's what our that's what this cooperative does. Um, what we our primary uh, products that we sell through grassroots are lifetime pasture raised beef, lifetime pasture raised lamb, uh, woodlot pork, and also lots and lots of pasture raised chickens. Um, Revenues for this uh, uh, cooperative were 2.5 million last year. We are again not at break even, but working hard to get there. The ranch, what I do at the ranch, as I've said before, is work very, very hard to scale up our enterprises and livestock to help meet the demands um, of this cooperative. Who, right now, with uh, grassroots, we actually have much more demand than we have supply, so it's a challenge. Uh, our, the CEO of Grassroots did a podcast with, I don't know if anyone knows Dave As Asprey, Bulletproof Products, Bulletproof Coffee, that kind of. So the demographic that is buying the product here is mostly on the East Coast, the West Coast, um, 
health conscious, moms that want to uh, serve their kids really good food. Um, it's a much more affluent consumer than in Arkansas. Or so, and that's okay. That's the target for this. That's the way that we're going to enable our farmers in Arkansas who are growing for this to make a living wage. So this is Heifer Ranch. This is where I work. I'm going to stop looking at my notes because it's messing me up. We're just going to go with this. <laughs> All right, this is Heifer Ranch. This is in Perryville, Arkansas. It's a 1,200-acre working ranch. Um, it started as a cattle, uh, holding a, a cattle company way back in the day in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and we bought it and basically the function of this ranch has been twofold. It's been, it's been to have people come to the ranch and learn about Heifer's work and our mission to end hunger and poverty. And it's also been a working ranch in terms of livestock and market garden uh, programs. One of, one of our main goals for this past year has been training farmers. So in terms of agriculture, we're really working on training air, farmers in the area that want to learn how to farm and be profitable at it. We, our goal for last year was to have 700 farmer trainings in sustainable agriculture um, and to build Heifer's uh, brand recognition as a world-class ag, ag education facility. Um, we've surpassed this goal. We have, a, uh, we have a training coming up next weekend with Greg Judy. I don't know if anybody knows him, but he's a, he's a well-known grazer. So he's a cattle farmer. Um, he raises sheep. Um, and Greg is coming. We sold out in about a week. So right now we've got about 75 people coming from all over. We have someone coming from South Dakota to do a two-day two class. We're moving more and more in this direction. Uh, offering day-long programs, trainings, but also offering more um, higher profile farmers to come on the ranch and give talks and have people come in and do classes with us. So this is a short little video showing some of our um, trainings that we do. This is Christine giving a poultry training. This is a day-long program free for people in the area to come and learn about how to raise pasture poultry. These are some of our prairie schooners. Uh, this year we're raising 1,700 chickens uh, for the grassroots market. Uh, we're looking to scale it up to 40,000 chickens all raised on pasture. Move daily in these. These are called prairie schooners. These trainings have really been wonderful. Um, I think, I, as I said, we were aiming to have 700 people come to the farm. We're about at 1,200 people, and then this next weekend it's going to put us way over that. So it's been very successful, and I feel like that's what we're supposed to be doing through Heifer, is training people to farm and to be profitable at it. We have a brand new farmer, farmer apprentice program. We have people that are coming and living on our ranch for two years. Um, to learn about sustainable agriculture. We have apprentice farmers in our market garden area as well as our livestock. Uh, these are two of our apprentice farmers working our cattle. In terms of, I think it's really amazing that at Heifer Ranch, the agriculture team is predominantly women. And right now we're seeing more and more women farmers who are getting into this there are 50% more uh, women farmers today than just 15 years ago. Women farmers generate $150 billion each year in agricultural sales. More young women than ever are farming. Um, so it's really important that we offer an example at Heifer Ranch as we have all these educational um, school children and, and visit, visitors come in. Um, they get to see, they see women on the ranch, running, driving tractors, herding cattle, shear, we don't shear sheep, working sheep. So they get to see this with their eyes and hopefully it sparks an interest that maybe they want to do this. These are a few faces of our staff. Um, th so we have five uh, paid staff people in our livestock department, four are women. I am actually the first female ranch manager in the history of Heifer Ranch. Thank you. 
couple more of our apprentice farmers in Market Garden. Tradesha is actually from Massachusetts. She was planning to go to the apprentice uh, program in Rutland and then decided to, when that facility closed, decided to come um, and work with us in Arkansas. In terms of, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, agricultural enterprises. So my task, one of my tasks at the ranch, besides training farmers and um, overseeing the agricultural staff, has been to greatly scale up our production. Um, so over the, I've been at Heifer Ranch now for a year, and we are in the process of really scaling things up. As I said before, one of the reasons that we're doing this is to help those cooperatives get off the ground. Um, I, I listen, I'm not a business person, but I feel like I'm beginning to be. Because I feel like I, I spend, if I'm in the car, I'm listening to a business podcast. If I'm in the tractor, I finally got a tractor with a cab that has air conditioning and I can like, listen to podcasts in the tractor. So I'm listening to entrepreneurs talk about how businesses survive. And one thing that I, I have learned over and over through reading books and listening to people talk about the Airbnb guy, his podcasts are fascinating. I, I listen to that on the flight coming here. But that it takes determination and the, and the knowledge that you're going to have to try and try and go different ways and then eventually something that you want to do is going to work. So that's what we're doing right now. We're, in, we're really in an exploratory phase at the ranch um, with our agricultural enterprises. Um, and it's, it's exciting work. So our market garden, we have a two acre um, certified organic market garden. Uh, the products that we're, we're raising in that garden are, like I said, certified organic. Also GAP and FISMA certified. Um, herbs, flowers, lots of stuff. Lots and lots of vegetables. Uh, the certification process that we're going through um, is both for our own use, but it's also the ranch serves as sort of a testing ground. We have the ability to go through the certification process, learn the best practices, learn how to document the process so that we can then give that to our cooperative farmers so that they can do it in a, in a more easily. Um, some of these processes are really daunting. Um, so we have the ability at the ranch to do that. We do that, you know, the, the gap in the FISMA certification is, a, is one example. We also, the ranch is, is a site where we test different non-GMO chicken feeds. Which feed is going to give us the higher yield so that we can then pass that on to our cooperative farmers who can use that feed. So this is our garden. And this is the main campus up at the ranch. Two and a half acres, certified. Uh, the upper part of the garden is used mostly with small hand tools. We don't use a lot of tractors in that area. What we want to be able to demonstrate is that a farmer can get into this at a relatively small scale with, lot of, with not a lot of inputs in, in terms of money spent on big item, you know, things like tractors or whatever, and be profitable. I did mention that in the apprentice farmer program, we're not only teaching our apprentice farmers how to grow food, but there's a business component of it as well. Because it's not, if you, lots of people know how to grow food. Lots of people like to farm. But to do that profitably, that's our goal. Um, and to teach that. So there's business classes um, in the Apprentice Farmer Program as well. In terms of our, our livestock, um, we just, so when I started at the ranch in, I don't know, February of last year, we had about 40 head of cattle, um, all different breeds. We did a lot of research to determine. There are 1,200 acres at the ranch. About half of that is in pine trees, and then there's a chunk of it that is in uh, buildings and roads and that kind of stuff. So really, we're looking at about 550 grazable acres. Now, the acreage, um, I think I have a slide of this in a minute, but the acreage mostly over the last 30 years has been leased out to other area farmers because we weren't rain, we weren't farming that much. It was mostly about education about Heifer International, which is awesome. But going back to our agricultural roots and wanting to scale up these enterprises, we had to pull the leases from those farmers, and they went, you know, they they we were down to about three farmers, so it wasn't a huge impact on those farmers. 
took the land back. But one thing that we're finding is that over the last 30 years, we rented, we rented the acreage for $2.50 an acre a month. So it wasn't a big revenue generator for us to have this acreage out in lease. We felt like we could do a lot more with it if we brought it back and really focused on getting livestock to have impact on those soils and, and forage and to get livestock back in as a training tool um, and also for product going into the cooperatives. So I like to think of the ranches as really a regenerative agriculture model. What we do, we, we really like to think of ourselves as um, grass farmers, I'm sure you've heard that before, focusing first on the soil, then the forage, and then the livestock that are grazing that land. So a lot of people talk about sustainable agriculture. I like to think about it as regenerative agriculture because our goal at Heifer Ranch is to regenerate uh, the lands down in the bottoms that have been overgrazed for the last 30 years. We have terrible soil quality. We have terrible forage. Um, right now, really, our only forage in the bottoms is tall fescue. Um, if anybody knows anything about, about forage, you know that that, you know, is only um, helpful about half the year because it goes into a summer slump and then your livestock really don't have that much to eat in the summer. So we're trying to diversify species of forage. And we're trying to move away from thinking uh, in, a, in a sustainable agriculture way to regenerative agriculture way. The key difference between regenerative agriculture and sustainable agriculture is the intention to regenerate or renew. That is definitely what we're doing at the ranch. The productivity and growth potential of whatever is being regenerated. So in our case, we have so much work to do in our soils. In my opinion, we shouldn't even be thinking about bringing more livestock in until we think about our soils and the forage that that soil is growing. Sustainable uh, practice, practices, on the <coughs> other hand, is to uh, seek to maintain the same. We definitely don't want to maintain the same at the range right now. We want to regenerate. So this is just, I wanted to show you, this is the bottoms. Most of that is in pine trees. We're taking, we're actually taking some of the pine trees out. Um, starting, I don't know the last time any soil samples have been done at the ranch. We took 400 and something soil tests uh, the first week that I was there. We're thinking about partnering with the Savory Institute, if anyone knows about the Savory Institute. Um, and doing their environmental verification outcome program where they have someone come in and train you how to make sure that you're actually inputting carbon in the soil and, and instead of depleting it. And then we did a lot, we, um, we invested in, in some implements, some tractors, some equipment that we needed to be able to Diversify forage, what you're seeing right now is um, us no-till drilling, seeds trying to get some diversity in our forage for our livestock. We hope to be able to lend this tool to other uh, farmers in the cooperative so that they can start improving their soils and their forage. Some of our cattle, and then I talked about the pine trees that, we, that were planted on the ranch. Um, those are some of the pines. So in terms of what is out there in our forage fields and our pastures, lots and lots of broom sedge. I don't think you all have broom sedge. Um, it's basically a weed that grows up and looks really beautiful. Um, oh, I had an interesting conversation with one of the top folks at Heifer that looked at a photograph that I had on Facebook and he said, that is the most beautiful pasture I've ever seen. You can graze those animals forever on that. It seems like it's limitless opportunity. It was a field full of broom sedge, which has no nutritional value. <laughs> uh, so we've been doing a lot of clipping of broom sedge, uh, planting cool season annuals. We're getting ready to plant warm season annuals again to offer diversity. I don't know if you all know about the flooding that's happening right now in Arkansas. Um, all of this land that you're seeing in these photographs is completely covered in water. So one thing, we've done this work, and now we have to go back in and and say, you know, I'm sure our tall fescue will survive just fine. 
Um, but what about the other forages that we planted or that we're encouraging to come up through rotational grazing, um, through sustainable agriculture, sustainable regenerative agriculture practices? Um, so we shall see. But I think that we, we took a hit with this flooding for sure. We did a lot of animal movement last week. Uh, the chickens were going off to be processed and we were placing our bets like, are we going to have to move this massive schooner or are the floodwaters, literally the floodwaters were like, I don't know, 25 feet away as we were packing up these chickens to go off to be processed. Um, so lots and lots of work on getting the land um, fertile and in shape and to sequester carbon and all of those kinds of things. In terms of our chicken production, we're growing about 18,000 chickens this year. Again, going to grassroots cooperative, and also for our own use on the, on the ranch for the groups that we feed. Um, that will scale up next year to about 20,000 chickens. Um, we built this. This picture in the bottom is a brooder. Um, so that's where our chicks started. We had to re we had to have a larger brooder to grow that many chickens. So that work has been done. We, we grow quite a few pigs at the ranch. We use our pine trees, so we do woodlot production. We grow, um, we're growing 160 feeder pigs for grassroots this year. Next year, we're gonna try to grow 300. We're gonna try to do this all in the pine trees and, and see what happens there. So I, I think it's gonna go well. Those are some of our pigs. I think they look great. <laughs> Our sheep enterprise, we have about 150 Katahdin sheep. We have a um, flock this year. 90 lambs from that flock go to Grassroots. That's been their best seller. We sold 60 lambs to Grassroots last year. It sold out in two days, so we're trying to scale that up. There are not many people in Arkansas that grow lamb, and there's a perception that, well, it's just a food that people aren't used to eating there. Um, but through the e-commerce site, selling mostly to the East Coast and West Coast, it's been a really, really strong product for, for Grassroots Cooperative. <coughs> so the big thing that we've done this year is bring cattle back to the ranch. Um, I think I said before, when I started there back in February, there were about 50 head of assorted breeds of cattle um, at the ranch. And, we did some investigating in terms of what species, what breed of cattle to bring, um, and I chose to go with South Pole cattle. It's a four-way cross that, the, the nice thing about South Pole is it's a very small breed of cow. They, you know, a thousand, a thousand pounds is the typical mom. Um, but more important than that, they really do well on grass alone. So our, gra our grass-fed products are completely lifetime grass-fed, no other inputs of anything. Um, so they need to do well on forage. Uh, they have easy mothering um, abilities, like they calf very easily. Uh, they usually have about six calves throughout their lifetime, opposed to other breeds that have a smaller number. So for a farmer, that information is really crucial because if you're having six, six calves a year instead of four, financially, that's, that's important. It's, it's really funny. I, when I was decided to take the position at Heifer Ranch, I was talking with my mom, and she was like, what kind of cows do they have there? And I said, they have this breed of cow called a South Pole. And she was like, a South Pole? She was like, that's the breed of cow your uncle Jim Frady worked with Teddy Gentry on. So anyway, South Poles are in my family, which is very interesting. And this is me out in the pasture on the first day that they arrived. So we bought 60 bred heifers, about 40 steers, and I think five cow-calf pairs. So we're on our way in terms of building a strong cow-calf operation. And I just think these cows are beautiful. So I took this photograph um, mid-February of this year. Those are steers that are two years old. Um, they're out on wheat and ryegrass. This is a <coughs> radical difference from the climate that I was used to growing in. I mean, look at this. 
look at the grass. This is mid-February in Arkansas. Um, downside of Arkansas is it is blazing hot, like, like nothing I've ever experienced. Um, but it's nice to be in management because when the, on those super, super hot days, you can be like, oh, I have desk work to do. <laughs> Um, this is a project my partner and I started in our kitchen uh, in Rutland, Mass. We had an abundance of milk and we had lard for some animals and we were trying to be profitable at Heifer Farm and decided, you know, let's use these, these byproducts to make a product of, uh, 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 and, and sell it through our gift shop. It cost us about 49 cents a bar to, to make this soap. And we sell it all day long for six and seven dollars and nobody buys an eye. This is the kind of stuff that we need to be teaching our farmers through Heifer. Um, so using value-added products, being able to diversify the products that you're selling, always looking for value-added revenue streams that you can stack on. So stacking on enterprises, I think that's the key to success. Another value-added product is agro-tourism. We do a women's lambing program. Um, we did it at Heifer Farm. We have to also do it at Heifer Ranch. So bringing in women from all over the country to spend three, four days at the ranch to learn about the process of gestation, birthing of sheep, but it's really about spending four days together, learning about heifers work throughout the world, connecting with each other, um, it's just a really special program and a really special time. Uh, we're planning to scale that up. So I was talking earlier about trying things and if you know you have to try lots of stuff and find things that find things that work. So this year we did two sessions of women's lambing and two sessions of lambing production. So trying to build on to the farmer training component of what we're doing at the ranch. Um, the production completely flopped. The curriculum was fantastic. We even had a butcher come in. Uh, we worked very closely with Cypress Valley. Um, it's part of the value chain of that, uh, our cooperative system in grassroots. We have a processing plant. Um, so the value chain, we, we work with relatively few farmers through the, exact, through, through the cooperatives themselves. But when you look at the value chain, it's really impactful. You have, a, you have a processing plant that is also a cooperative, so people that work at the processing plant are owners of the, of the company. Uh, you have people trucking uh, all of the GMO feed that we feed in our cooperative. So there's lots of um, employment opportunities that have been added by the generation of these cooperatives. Go back to landing. So we tried this production, it completely failed, but we had brought in a butcher from Cypress Valley and he did a demonstration and then we uh, ate a meal together uh, and cooked some lamb that he broke down, breaking down a carcass. It was insanely popular. Like you all know, that this is like we're in right now, having a butcher come in and show you how to break down a carcass and then have a really cool uh, meal over a campfire. So we'll take that component and run a program with that or add it to even women's lambing. We also added a, a, a breakfast this year at Women's Lambing in the, in the evaluations. That was the thing that they liked. I had this idea, we have these big cooktop like fire pit things. We have all these cows, let's have, a, let's have a, a breakfast on the final day. Let's close out the session of Women's Lambing with this thing called chow with the cows. So you get on a trailer, you go down as the sun's coming up through the cattle fields. Um, ends up, you know, at this beautiful holly grove with uh, a lake around it. Sun's coming up and you have breakfast together and it really was impactful. So you learn these things that work and then you expand them um, and it's just all part of the process of trying to diversify offerings. And I think that's it. There's some questions. I'm curious um, whether Heifer is intentionally trying to engage with more female farmers and, and hire more, more females, and if so, 
whether you're having a hard time filling, you know, I, I, want, I don't want to use the word quota, but you get the intention. I think, I don't know that there's an intention within, say, our HR department to hire more women. I do think that Heifer International has what we call the cornerstones, and one of our cornerstones, so this is our values system, and one of our cornerstones is gender equity. So it is very important to Heifer that women are represented um, in the programs throughout the world and also at the ranch, that we have a good representation and strong women. We feel like it's important to be able to show that for our visitors that come to the ranch. Lee? Hi. Um, I just want to say that I'm a program. Thank you. I went through the training program in Heifer, as did a lot of people around here, and then we started our own farm. So I think a lot of women are learning. That's really what I've noticed with Heifer, that that's part of your global outreach uh, that affected us in, in this whole community. So thank you. Hi. Um, first, I'd like to say I really appreciate you, you talking about regenerative agriculture because that was sort of one of the things that's been on my mind is like, you know, knowing how certain types of like livestock farming, you know, com commercial livestock farming and things like that have, you know, uh, ended up, you know, over many times in history depleting the land on which it is and how like a lot of like, you know, besides maintaining the land that we still have for farming, I think also like, you know, making the land healthier in general is a very, you know, very uh, wonderful goal. Um, but also, I was wondering if any of your programs involve uh, any kind of like training in political advocacy, because I'm aware that um, a lot of times, like both on the federal and the state level, maybe not so much in Vermont, I'm not sure, but in definitely in some Midwestern states, uh, a lot of the laws regarding farming are, um, you know, due to like the impact of lobbying groups are sort of like they uh, are biased towards, uh, you know, massive like um, industrialized corporate farming and that can leave, uh, you know, people trying to farm for their families sustainably or regeneratively, uh, they, that can leave them at a severe like disadvantage when those laws aren't designed to protect them. Okay, that's a loaded question. So I think that instead of, I think that we are training people to be advocates through the act of learning how to, the first part of what you said in terms of regenerative agriculture, the importance of diversified species, diversified crops. We don't actively go out and teach people to be political advocates or lobbyists, but what we are doing is pe teaching people how to be advocates for themselves and to learn the importance of this and to be able to um, continue it. And I, I didn't mention in my talk, we don't use a heifer, a heifer ranch. Regenerative agriculture is so important to us. We don't use any kind of synthetic fertilizers. And we're really using diversified species to regenerate the land. So no fertilizers, no herbicides, and none of that. Um, so yeah, I didn't answer your question, but Last question. Hi. I'm really excited about the stuff that I'm seeing here today. Um, my question is more along the science of it. When you take soil samples, when you took your soil samples and the organization that you're working with um, tested those soils, it typically and traditionally you're looking for chemical makeup. Um, a lot of, of soil testing now surrounds looking for the biodiversity in the soil itself. Is that something that you are looking for and documenting and sharing with the other farmers and how that relates to your ability to diversify your crop? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are at the very beginning stages of this. So we've already taken just general soil samples. Now we're going back in. We're taking specific soil samples to get a baseline of our carbon and diversity in the soil. Um, we're, I, I'm going on Sunday for, to meet with Will Harris at White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia. His farm is the first farm in the country um, to receive recognition that he's actually giving back more in terms of carbon sequestration through a large livestock operation that is diversified and regenerative that he's taking. And I really am looking forward to talking about um, how those tests are done. Um, 
uh, right now I don't know the answer to that. I think one of the key um, ways that we're going to know this is partnering with, with organizations like uh, the Savory Institute, who really has come up with uh, testing mechanisms that are accurate and scientific to look at the soil and then look at how regenerative agriculture affects the soil. Right. Awesome. Yeah.